Hello and welcome to the Celtic History Podcast with me, Liam Kelly. Today's episode is the first guest episode that we've got. I'm delighted to say that I'm joined by a well-known Celtic author and historian, David Potter. So David and I actually worked together on a, on a book called Wilfred and the Wild Boys uh, alongside Matt Core. Um, that looked at Celtic's founding fathers, the first season and the early stars. Um, beyond that, I know that David's written approximately 50 books, uh, the majority of which I believe are about Celtic, but have also covered other parts of Scottish history and Scottish sport as well. Um, but the reason why I've got David on today is to talk about his new book, which is all about Alec McNair, an early Celtic legend. Uh, so welcome to the show, David, and so glad to have you on. Oh, thank you very much. It's great to be on your show. Nice to, uh, nice to meet everybody, and I hope we can maybe entertain them and tell them a wee bit about uh, this famous man by the name of Alec McNair. Yep, so, so we'll, um, through the course of the podcast, we'll discuss the book, but also give listeners a bit more information about Alec McNair. So it's uh, a name that everybody should know and is um, an important figure from Celtic's early history. Uh, so first of all, if I start off the podcast by just asking, uh, what was your inspiration for writing the book about Alec McNair? Um, I think uh, inspiration is possibly the, uh, the wrong word. Um, I just feel that uh, Celtic supporters and Scottish uh, football people in general really ought to know a lot more about the history of, um, of Scottish football and, of course, in particular, Celtic uh, football club. I mean, I, I've already written a book on Jimmy Quinn and uh, uh, Sonny Jim Young and Jimmy McMenemy and so on, and uh, I'd like to think I'm working my way through that famous team and Alec McNair just seemed the obvious person to, uh, to go on to next. Um, having said that, I was quite amazed by some of the things that I discovered about Alec McNair, just the sheer length of his career, apart from anything else. Yeah, I mean, I'd say I've done some research myself into like a World War II book, and I even came across some information about Alec McNair from, obviously, he'd finished playing by then. Um, yeah but that it was, he'd made friends with a Partick Thistle player and the pair were meeting up for coffee every Tuesday morning. And uh -huh, uh -huh. the cafe where they went, there was a newspaper report to say that it had been bombed, um, but that it wasn't stopping them from still going for their coffees every Tuesday. Uh, that's good, that's so, good, yeah. That's so, good, yeah. Yeah. Um, Maybe it would be more difficult to get a cup of coffee uh, in Glasgow. I don't know, but uh, it's. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but so, so, why do you think that it's important that um, you know, supporters, particularly Celtic supporters, sort of know a bit more about these early legends? I know you mentioned you've written books about Sonny Jim Young and Jimmy Quinn, um, now obviously McNair and that was obviously a famous kind of Celtic team. Um, so I just want to get your thoughts to see. Well, just um, basically because uh, what we saw at the bring up, bang up to date, what we saw at the weekend in George Square and things like that, I mean, these sort of things don't need to be like that. And to a certain extent, I hold uh, Celtic responsible for uh, that sort of antisocial behaviour that we saw on, uh, on Saturday night, because if we had won the league as we should have done, that would never have happened. And um, Celtic supporters can celebrate in a very, very responsible way. And we need to tell Celtic supporters and the world in general that this sort of thing doesn't need to be like this. And really, the norm should be that Celtic should win the league every single year. And that's why I'm very keen to make people realise that uh, Celtic are a team of great tradition and with an awful lot to be proud of. I mean, maybe winning every single year is putting it a bit strong, but they should win it 
most years, as indeed, to be fair, they have been doing of late. And uh, I think it's very important that we praise famous men and we'll learn more about the great players that we've had, in particular, men like Alec McNair. The, uh, he was part of one of the, the, the Holy Trinity, well, there's several Holy Trinities, of course. The, you can say that of Shaw, McNair and Dodds. Uh, you can also say of the half-back line of Young, Loney and He, although quite a lot of people make a mistake by thinking that Shaw McNair and Dodds and Young Loney and he played in the same team, they didn't. There was, uh, it was actually Young Loney and Johnston you could get along with Shaw McNair and Dodds or Adams McNair and Weir, uh, Young Loney and he and so on. But uh, the key character, the central character is of course uh, Alec McNair who was a, a, a splendid character and uh, really there was not really much wrong in his career for Celtic over his 20 years. Uh, he was a tremendous servant of the club. So you, you mentioned there about the Holy Trinity. I was going to come on to that a little bit later. So, so he was, am I right in saying that they set the Scottish football clean sheet record or shutout record? I think they did. It was yeah. uh, it was rivaled exactly a hundred years later by uh, uh, people like Virgil Van Dijk and Jason Denier and uh, and folks like folk like that. But uh, I think Celtic went uh, a record of um, I think they lost one goal between the start of October and the end of February between 1913 and 1914. Uh, they were really. A, a tremendous team. And of course, you really need to have uh, great defenders. I know that Celtic are not really famous for uh, their defenders. I mean, we tend to be more of the attacking uh, gung-ho sort of type. Uh, but we're, you really need to have great defenders as well to prevent goals going in the other end, as we have noticed this season. Yeah. And, yeah. and so, I mean, you, you mentioned, obviously, earlier about... Uh, Celtic should be looking to win the league most seasons. Obviously, mm -hmm. in McNair's career, that tended to happen quite a lot, along with it did indeed, yes. Scottish Cups yes. and other trophies as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, in my book, I've detailed all the all the cups that the the won and uh, the leagues that they won. And uh, Alec McNair was just uh, he was just an ever present in the. Uh, and most he was very seldom injured, which was a good thing. Very seldom injured, and usually when he was injured, uh, you knew it because the team suffered some or another, you know. But uh, uh, one of the things that I discovered about him was that he was also a very versatile player. In that he started off being a forward and played, for example, the 1906 to 1907 season as a centre half. Uh, he was sent there because right half, uh, right back, sorry, in these days was uh, held by a chap called Donny McLeod, who also came from Stennis Muir, uh, as it turned out, and McNair fitted in at centre half when Willie Looney broke his arm. And it was only 1907 to 1908 that he established himself uh, as the right back. But of course, once he established himself as the right back, he stayed as the right back until 1923 and beyond on occasion. Thank you for that. Um, so say probably I go more into actual detail about the book specifically. Um, yeah. So once you decided to write the book and sort of focus on a biography of McNair's life as such, um, yeah. how does that process sort of work? Do you, do you sort of contact any relatives or descendants at all to get information, or is it purely newspapers? Well, honestly, uh, in this case, I was um, I was not really very successful looking for descendants through the good offices of the Celtic Star. Uh, they appealed. I appealed through um, Celtic Star asking for uh, descendants to come forward. Nobody did so. Apparently, some have now appeared. Now the book has been published. Ironically enough, but they maybe were not in a position to help me very much anyway. So I was very much dependent on uh, newspaper reports uh, plus. Well, I'd heard about Alec McNair from people like my father and my grandfather. And it was from newspaper reports that I really started and uh, worked my way through um, his career. I also went to Stennis Muir to see his gravestone. And so I'm very grateful to uh, a lady who showed me where it was. Uh, it's a uh, Larbert Cemetery where he's buried. is a huge place. And if you don't know what you're looking for in a, a cemetery, you usually find it rather difficult. But this lady was able to tell me about uh, Alec McNair. And, and McNair is a fairly common name around about Stennis Muir as well. 
Um, but I was able to uh, find out quite a lot about him. Uh, I was then able to use Scotland's people, which tells me about births and so on, uh, and uh, the British newspaper archive, for which I've got a subscription, and that uh, gives quite a lot of detail about um, his early career. Annoyingly, there are gaps. Uh, annoyingly, there are gaps sometimes in a particular thing you want to get, but in particular, uh, the Scottish referee is a very, very good uh, publication in the very early years of the of the 20th century, and I used that one uh, that one quite a lot. Yeah, and I say I, I, I use the British newspaper archive myself for a lot of books that I do from anything sort of World War Two and and prior yeah, yeah. to that. Yeah. So it's quite and it's quite good to look at the way the match reports are done, and um, it's a completely different style to nowadays. I often find that kind of reported back to front that we start with the the winning goal and then you'll hear about uh -huh. the first half and, and yes, then indeed uh, and, uh, and and the, the euphemisms the, the way for uh, scoring a goal somebody shot through apparently can mean that's a goal you yeah. know i think in many days if you say somebody shot through that means he's left his wife or something you know if, if it means <laughs> anything at all but it's uh, you know there's all sorts of things that we um you know and uh, uh, you know the words like uh, the sphere, the sphere being the ball. Yeah. You know the the sphere was propelled through the mud and this sort of stuff. But it's fascinating to read that sort of thing. You know, fascinating. You know? I came uh, across a um, I came across a report. I forget what the newspaper was now. I uh, done a quick search on McNair, and it said that um, although he was mostly say quite a defensive. Um, sort of minded defender, whereas even sometimes be like centre halves, or the old style centre halves would have actually sometimes gone and pushed forward and attacked. A oh bit. yes, yes, yeah. That, um, if you played centre half in these days, uh, you usually were able to interchange with uh, with the centre forward. Centre halves and forwards changed quite quickly, and Celtic were able to uh, use this because Willie Looney and uh, Jimmy Quinn had a, I wouldn't say they looked like one another, but they ran apparently in the same way and they could interchange and, uh, and fool people. And uh, one of the great things about Celtic's great teams is that they're, they're, the players can interchange. They're not hidebound, as it were, to one position. Certainly the great team in which McNair played uh, can do that. And the great team in the 1930s um, was able to do that as well. And Jock Steen's team in the 1960s was able to interchange. You know, Jimmy Johnson would suddenly appear on the left wing and uh, people would say, ah, we Jimmy, we Jimmy's got a roving commission today which meant he could go wherever he wanted, you know, this sort of thing. And that's one of the features of um, great Celtic teams is they, they can interchange. They're not, they don't say things like, oh, I'm a right back, I mustn't go any further than 10 yards further forward. There, there's nothing like that. As I say, sort of touching on that, I've found in this report, there was a mention that McNair had strode forward. And I think the, the quite, um, sorry, the quote was McNair strode forward and made the opposition defence twang like a banjo. Oh, yes, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, if anything, there are more references to McNair staying back and Joe Dodds going forward. Joe yeah. Dodds was more the attacking uh, fullback of the of the Tommy Gemmel type, for example. You know, the attacking fullback. But uh, uh, no, there's certainly um, uh, it's fascinating, as you say, to read what uh, about uh, about McNair and how he how he played. But but the, the cultural side of it is uh, quite fascinating as well. Um, I find from the point of view of um, of Alec McNair because uh, he was actually he does say that he was uh, when he was young he didn't actually support Rangers, but he did look for their results more than anyone else. Now, of course, that was uh, understandable because when he was first interested in football, it would have been round about the years 1901, 1902, when Rangers did indeed um, uh, win the league. And um, it must have been quite a big step for somebody from a, a United Free Church background in 1904 
to go to Celtic Park. He was by no means the first uh, non-Catholic to play for, for Celtic because from a very early stage, uh, Celtic abandoned anything uh, as stupid as that. And um, uh, But it still must have been quite a cultural uh, leap to go, uh, not only crossing the religious divide, but also going to live and work in a large city because uh, Stennis Muir, although heavily industrialised, is actually quite a small place. And uh, Glasgow is not all that far away, but uh, it's a uh, Glasgow in 1903, 1904 was a huge industrial, dirty sort of place, and uh, it must have been a great uh, step for Alec to travel as he did apparently every morning in life on uh, London Midlands Scottish Railway from Larbert Station to Glasgow, to Glasgow Buchanan Street. It must have been quite a, quite a step for him to do that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, one of the listeners had sent in a question to ask that, that very question that you've kind of covered there about whether or not McNair was a Rangers fan. But um, I'd say probably his signing was quite symbolic in the sense that although, as you say, he wasn't the first non-Catholic by any means, um, but there was, I'd always noted his, his name in that regard because of a quote from Willie Maley that I'd seen that said, um, you know, much is made about our religion, but since the club's second season, uh, we've, you know, signed and employed players and staff of, um, you know, various different religions and goes on to say men of the type of McNair and then lists all different mm, yeah, players. Yep, yep, yep. Um, so, uh, yes. so you say McNair is the... And I mentioned earlier, was a serial winner, possibly one of the most decorated players in the club's history. Um, he was part of several famous Celtic teams. You'd probably say, but well, in my opinion anyway, I'd say probably outside of the Lisbon Lions, or in that up until the Lisbon Lions, it would have been the most successful team, that, mm -hmm. that side mm -hmm. that sort of won the six in a row and going on from there. In, in particular, the season 1907 to 1908, which was um, Alex's first season at right back. And uh, they won every competition they entered for in that season, as indeed did the Lisbon Lions. And frankly, you can't really argue against that. I would uh, love to um, have seen the pair of them playing each other to find out whether 1908 was better than 1967. I would love to see that. But that's just a, an otios academic uh, question. I mean, they beat everybody it was put in front of them, and you can't ask any more than that. As simple as that. Yeah, I would say that's that was one of the big things that interested me in the in the book. Um, as soon as I'd seen that you'd written about McNaggs, you see, because I was thinking everybody knows that there's been lions, and for for good reason. But say this, these teams are quite possibly up there. I know we don't have the the video footage, but just purely seeing their achievements and beyond their achievements, you've got near enough every player is like a, a Celtic legend. So that Joe Dodds had played for several years. And, um, so you've touched on like what I know one of your favourite Celts in Jimmy Quinn and these type of things. It's just name after name that is like rolls off the tongue. And mm -hmm. um, it's sort of one of the, one of the things that, you know, in songs like Willie Maley, people will hear of Jimmy McGrory and, these sorts of names, but there's another song by Charlie and the Boys called Celtic Overall, and mm -hmm. they mention in there Napoleon and the Icicle. See the nicknames yep. for, for Jimmy yep. McManamy yep. and uh, and Alec McNair. So I just yeah. wanted, obviously, the the book's called uh, Alec McNair Celtic's Icicle, mm -hmm. um, and it's possibly that a lot of people nowadays perhaps know McNair most famously for his nickname, the Icicle. Uh, so I just wondered um, how that nickname sort of came about. I think it's just because he was able to keep cool under pressure. As simple as that. He was able to keep cool under pressure, uh, not only in the football field, but also in his home life. There were at least two occasions when things went very badly wrong in his uh, home life. And Alec was able just uh, to, to cope with him because I think he was that sort of stolid, phlegmatic kind of character 
um, uh, of which the the Scottish working class is actually full because the the, the Scottish working class are, are very able to cope with adversity. I think uh, more than um, other uh, um, you know people in the world. Um, and the two th uh, things that I refer to, of course, is when uh, when Alex's uh, baby daughter died. She died uh, on the, the 1911 Scottish Cup final. The first game was a draw against Hamilton Mackies. The second game, uh, Celtic won 2-0 the following Saturday. And on the Tuesday, I think it was, between these two Saturdays, his wee daughter, Helen McNair, died. Uh, you know, she, she hadn't been very well. She, uh, she was one of these children that didn't, you know, it's what was called failure to thrive, um, I think. There were other reasons for it. But uh, Alec had to make up his mind, am I going to uh, am I going to play in the Scottish Cup final replay? And I think he made the right decision uh, and, and did so. I think he did so. And of course, he won another uh, Scottish Cup medal. And then uh, several years after that, something far more serious happened. And that was in August 1915 when his uh, wife died. Mary died uh, in 1915, leaving Alec with children to bring up on his own which he did. Uh, he had, um, again, another feature of Scottish working class life is that the, the, the extended family all rallied round. I mean, Alec's mother was still alive. He had several sisters uh, and, uh, and so on. And they were able to look after the children while he continued his job, which in 1915 was, of course, in uh, uh, a war-related uh, industry, possibly in Bowness. We're not sure about that. We're not sure about that. Uh, but um, certainly maybe not there all the time, but also to play football uh, on a Saturday for Celtic. And uh, uh, he owes an awful lot to his family uh, for that reason. But uh, Celtic owe an awful lot to Alec McNair for his sheer bravery and courage in coping with these awful situations and still turning out to play the excellent football uh, that he did. And um, I think he was also a great help uh, also in, in 1915, uh, just so happened before the Glasgow Cup final of 1915 that two Celtic players lost a brother in, uh, in the war at the Battle of Luce. L -O -L -L -Luz, or L-O-L, or however you, you pronounce it. Uh, and the two people were, of course, uh, Joe Dodds and Jimmy McMenemy. And uh, were they going to play in the Glasgow Cup final uh, against Rangers on the Saturday? And uh, Melee thought that they should, uh, but he left it to them. And uh, Alec McNair, who had just recovered from his uh, wife's death, just getting over his wife's death, he also said he thought they should. And they did play, and they beat Rangers 2-0. And uh, that uh, shows a special kind of courage in um, very adverse circumstances that it's difficult for us uh, to imagine. And uh, for, for reasons like this, I think Alec deserves his nickname of the icicle. I mean, it would have been very easy for him just to uh, give up or to, uh, um, you know, become ill himself or, or something like that because he couldn't cope with life. But uh, he, he was grim, he was determined, and he kept going. And uh, I think for that reason, um, he does deserve to be looked upon as one of Celtic's greatest ever characters. And I use the word characters as well as just uh, player. But uh, he will always be one of my great characters, my great uh, heroes. It will be Alec McNeil. I say it says a lot about the mentality of that Celtic team, um, in the sense that say you mentioned, see Joe Dodds, that was another one of the Holy Trinity, um, that he had a lot of personal sort of issues to deal with, and um, say the way that Willie Maley and the club also supported them through that. Yes, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Find that side of things always quite interesting as well, looking at um, you know, an insight into the personality of the players and and the whole almost like family type feel about the club in that sort of era. Um I'd I'd also heard as well that McNair's sort of playing style leading on from the sort of ability to keep cool under pressure, uh, was that he quite often obviously clear the ball if needed but they quite often play out from the back and that that was something that was quite kind of unusual for for that time 
Yes, yes. He, he, he did have the ability to, to bring the ball forward. Uh, at one point in his life, I've said that he was a versatile player. He, he'd also played at right half, which is more a, a, a chap that carries the ball forward uh, in these days. And that was what uh, Alec McNair was able to do. Or, of course, he was famous for what is now illegal in football, which is uh, the pass back to the goalkeeper. The famous statement of pass it back to Charlie uh, when he was playing golf one day and uh, he didn't know he was in a bunker. He didn't know how to play it, whether to hook it or drive it, whatever it was. And he was thinking about it and somebody said, oh, just pass it back to Charlie. And of course, everybody burst out laughing because that was what the, the statement was. If I've got a problem, what will I do? I'll pass it back to Charlie, to Charlie Shaw, the, the, the legendary and, uh, and wonderful goalkeeper that Celtic had as well that time. So, um, the, as they say, that insight into you know stories like that of the kind of humorous side, and um, say on on the on the flip side of that, the tragedy that McNair in particular endured, losing his kind of daughter and um, his wife as well, and then living through the First World War. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, see, yeah. the whole time, um, did he remain in Stenhouse Mill throughout his whole? Sort of career his whole life uh, he certainly there was he certainly died in that area in 1951 he was um he was a manager of dundee for a season and a half after the from 1925 to halfway through the uh, the 1926 to 27 season um so he was uh, presumably he stayed in dundee for a while around about that point or else he could have perhaps traveled every day uh, but uh, as far as I'm aware, he, he wouldn't have gone far from the Stenismuir area because, of course, he still had his children who were growing up. One of his sons, uh, incidentally, played for Falkirk, uh, had a, a game or two for Falkirk. I think he was called Alec McNair as well. So, yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, to answer your question, yeah, he did stay in that part of the world. And at one point, he was a stockbroker. Now, it's most unusual for a football player to become a stockbroker, but that was what he was. He became a stockbroker, and uh, if you wanted to send telegrams to him, it was uh, uh, McNair Celtic, Stennis Muir, or something like that. That was his, uh, uh, his, his address. So um, okay. well, that was his telegram address. Is so that... clearly, uh, you know, he had a great... Uh, Celtic had a great effect on him as well as him having a great effect on Celtic. Uh, a tremendous contribution the man had. Tremendous. So does the does the book sort of look into his life away from football as well, looking at that um say that kind of personal issues that he'd had with the family and um, you know, his life in Stenhouse Moor, that type of thing. Yes, it is, because, I mean, you can't really judge a football player without realising what he's going through, what is, you know, the times he lived in, his personal uh, circumstances and, and so on. And it's, sometimes it's very difficult to find exactly what's going on because it's, it's not documented. It's not documented exactly what was going on in his family at any particular point uh, in the way that a football match is documented because of the, the wealth of newspapers that the British newspaper archive has. So, um, uh, yes, but the, I think, you know, if you're doing a biography of anyone, you've got to look at the times that uh, he lived in, the town in which he lived, the circumstances in which he lived, and uh, come and make a, a picture of what the man actually was and explain why he was the sort of football player uh, that he was. Like, for example, I've said that he was an icicle on the park and he was an icicle off the park. I mean, we can see this in his character. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's that part of it that's interesting, um, especially for me anyway, to, you know, f firstly, you know, about McNair, the legend, the, the man that won all these trophies on the pitch and was part of a great Celtic backline. Um, but then to also see you know, what was going on in his, in his own life. Um, <laughs> hear the dog there. <laughs> Um, Excuse me just for a minute, I'll put this dog through in the room. Just give me a yep. second, will you? All yep. right, give it to you. No worries. Right, okay. Yeah, so um, it says I touched on there, the, the sort of personal side of his life is what makes for quite interesting reading as well as the, the player that won all these trophies and was mm -hmm. such, mm -hmm. such a great defender. 
Um, I, I mean, I find it particularly interesting in that sense of people like Willie Maley that you've written about before as well, and that you'd see things like um, that although he supported like, Irish home rule, he was also a royalist and that type of thing mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. So it's good to get that sort of insight into people. Um, yeah, yeah. So I mean, one of the questions sort of that have been sent in from one of the people that listens to the podcast um, was, did you have anything in the book at all about before he joined Celtic? And as an extension of that, was it true that Willie Maley looked at McNair on a trial basis and originally didn't sign him and later came back for him? I think that's true, yes. He did certainly play for uh, for Stennis Muir and a few juvenile Juvenile teams, one of them called Stenisphere Hearts, if I remember correctly. Uh, Willie Mealy had a look at them, didn't immediately take to him, but uh, and gave him he gave him a trial in a friendly game for Celtic uh, a year before he actually signed him. Uh, so Mealy took his time to assess. Uh, uh, McNair, and it was only when they actually met each other, apparently, that a bond grew up, you know, a social bond grew up between the two of them, and they both felt that they could do business with each other. You know, although most of uh, McNair's talking was, of course, done on the park, um, and, uh, and, and he also, uh, McNair, when he started with Celtic, he was all his versatility was a great help for him because he was quite happy to stay in a position that uh, was not necessarily uh, going to be his own. He was quite uh, happy to stay around, to learn the trade, to be a, a sort of mobile reserve, as you were, uh, uh, as you can as you can imagine, uh, and uh, almost like what a modern player would be as a substitute. I mean, you didn't have substitutes in his day, but he was able to uh, fit in wherever he was told to, wherever he was needed. And um, I think that was one of the, the great things about McNair because it showed they had the character and he was prepared to see that it was very much a team game and that Celtic were a team worth, uh, worth working for. And uh, Mealy realised that, and uh, there is very little evidence. In fact, I would go as far as to say there was there was no evidence at all that I can think of of McNeil, of Mealy and McNair ever having words. There were never any tantrums. There was never any um, sort of no coming back sort of thing. And what you know, I join another club. There was nothing ever ever like that. And uh, McNair very soon became part of Celtic. Yeah. Stayed there. Yeah. I mean, is is it am I right in saying that Willie Maley named him as Celtic captain for a for a time? Yes. Um, he wasn't actually really cut out to be a captain. He actually did a better job as being a captain's help. He was a, a sort of advisor to the captain because I think that uh, Alec McNair felt that he he needed also to you know if somebody would had fallen out with the real captain he needed also to go to this guy put his arm around him say now come on now you can do a wee bit better than that Patsy you know don't worry about that and uh, with Tommy McAnally and people like that uh, that had he been captain that might not have been quite so easy I don't think Alec was a, a Scott Brown type domineering kind of a captain I don't think he would have fitted in. As a captain, he was more of a, a sort of what you would call in a Scottish uh, secondary school, a guidance teacher, somebody who, uh, who would be there so he could cry on his shoulder and uh, sort of talk things over with him because he himself had been through so much, so much in his private life and, and indeed on the field. And uh, I think he was captain just for a, for a very, very short time, but uh, he was quite happy to concede the captaincy of the club to, I think it was Charlie Shaw that he, uh, that he conceded to. But he was, he, he was captain for a short time, but uh, he was funnily enough, he was captain for Scotland several times. But that, again, is a different thing because that's just, uh, you know, a couple of days that you're captain. You yeah. know, you're not captain long term. It's a, it's a different thing altogether. Yeah, because, I, I mean, I sort of had that similar impression that from what I kind of read about McNair that he didn't seem that sort of, you know, noisy leader as such as, say, going by his nickname as the Icicle and everything yeah, yeah. that you've sort of said about him. He seemed as... 
I thought maybe he might be a similar type of captain in the sense that if Callum McGregor takes over from Scott Brown, one that maybe leads by example as such rather than sort of shouting at others and that type of thing. This is this is a reasonable um, assumption, I think. That's a reasonable assumption. I could imagine um, being a wee bit like Callum McGregor, yes. Uh, Scott Brown, I mean, you, you, it's obvious when you watch Celtic that Scott Brown's the captain. You know, you see him with his gestures and so on. It was obvious that Billy McNeil was the captain because Billy was going around always going like this and, you know, telling people what to do and and, uh, and so on. Uh, but I think McNair was more of a, a quiet, thoughtful sort of a player and a player who would take some time to analyse a game. You know, allow, he'd allow it to go for about 10, 15 minutes before he'd make any decision on it. He'd, he would have a look well, quite well, he's playing, obviously. I look at which player was playing well for Celtic and which player was playing badly for the opposition and, and so on and act accordingly. I think he was that sort of type of a person. I mean, that would sort of make sense with how he went on to get involved in management with Dundee. Um, with Dundee, yes, that's brilliant. Did, yeah. Do you know, obviously, I don't want to give too much away from what's in the book at all, but did, did, did things go well at Dundee? Because I noticed he wasn't there for, for very long. No, no, not particularly. Dundee is a, it was a difficult club to uh, manage, I think, in the 1920s because it was a team of fairly high expectations, fairly high expectations. They won the Scottish Cup way back in 1910. Uh, in the 1920s, they were good enough. And, of course, they're well supported by the local press. The local press, the Dundee Courier and the Dundee Advertiser, there was two of them in these days, are very much... Um, uh, talk about Dundee more or less all the time. And uh, a lot is expected of Dundee, and it didn't quite make it in uh, 1920s. It had loads of good players, loads of very good players, but they were uh, they never really, uh, well, they never won the league until uh, 1962. They won the League Cup in, 50, in the 1950s, never won the league until 1962. And uh, No, I think Dundee was a rather difficult team to manage because of the high expectations of their of their supporters and of course also in Dundee there was the Irish element I mean the uh, in the 1920s probably half of Dundee supported Dundee and the other half supported Celtic uh, it was very much the this this comes across uh, quite a lot in the Dundee uh, newspapers that there's an awful lot about Celtic and there's a reason for that there's a reason for that, of course, because the Irish and Dundee supported Celtic. Dundee United, who had originally been Dundee Hibs, were just a poor, almost inconsequential team in uh, in the 1920s. You know, they weren't uh, they weren't as big as what they are now. You know, as they became in the 1960s. Yeah, you, know? I, I, you see, I found that because I'm uh, researching Celtic during the World War Two years at the moment. Right. I found there's quite a lot of good information not just match reports, but actually Celtic-related news in the Dundee Evening Telegraph. You say they, Very they, much so. Yeah. They kind of, um, you, you obviously find a lot of that in the Glasgow papers, but I find that a lot of the other regions would focus on their local teams with an odd mention of if a Celtic player had been married who lived in that area or something. Whereas yeah, 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 yeah. Dundee Evening Telegraph tends to go into a bit more detail. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Well, so was I can't remember on the dates exactly with McNair being at Dundee, but would he have been involved with Dundee when they played against Celtic? I think it was the 1925 Scottish Cup final. He went there immediately after that. The night the Patsy Gallagher Cup final, he was there the following year, he, immediately after that. In fact, it may even have been the 12 over a hand and they said, oh, by the way, do you want to take it? You know, so, yeah. yes, uh, Alec was in the plane in 1925, obviously, and he, he was obviously at the end of his career by that point. But no, it was the, the following year that he was the uh, manager of Dundee. The following year and a half, uh, manager of Dundee. I suppose they could have asked him some, for some advice on how to defend against... Uh... An attacker somersaulting into the net with a ball between his feet. There's no way of defending <laughs> against that one, I'm afraid, Liam. No way at all. Yeah. <laughs> um, so what, one other question I had sent in, uh, again, was from a, a listener to the podcast. And they said, is it is it true that McNair is actually Celtic's record appearance maker or is it Billy McNeil? Because I think there's been some a little bit of dispute about this. 
there has been a little bit of dispute. Now, I am prepared to admit that I am open to correction on this point, but I think I make it that, and I'll be checked what I wrote, I think it's 716 appearances that I've counted that Alec made altogether. Uh, something along that nature, uh, 716. Give me a second while I get the exact figures. I, I did have them at one point uh, because we... Um, but I think in any case, Billy McNeil played more. I think okay. Billy McNeil played more. I, I think we can nail that one on the head simply because there was more football to be played. European fixtures and so on. There's more football to be played. They both, uh, uh, McNeil played longer, I think, than McNeil did, but uh, uh, there, were more, there was more football to be played. And annoyingly, uh, here we have, I've got, I make them 716 appearances in uh, Scottish League, Scottish Cup, Glasgow Cup, and Glasgow Charity Cup. Uh, Bill McNeil, something like getting on for 800, I believe. But again, uh, there's, there are grey areas because I'm not sure that McNeil's appearances count the times he played in the Glasgow Cup. And there was all sorts of tour games and, uh, you know, games in America that McNeil played. And uh, McNeil played a few uh, games in Europe because Celtic went to Europe quite a lot in the 1900s, you know, for the summer tours. But I think we can say that uh, Alec is second to Billy McNeil. Uh, yeah. Whether he's second in ability and contribution, uh, I wouldn't like to say. I, um, I think they're both equal. I would put them. I would put McNeil uh, on a pedestal uh, as uh, alongside Billy McNeil. And that, frankly, is saying something, because Billy McNeil was my hero, still is. I think that kind of shows how important it is that fans, especially younger supporters, and that sort of, you know, read this book and um, find out more about the likes of McNair. Because so he's arguably um, as good as McNeil. He's captained the club for a period. He's, um, you know, say the, the second highest record appearance maker with over 700 odd games for the club. Uh, he's won several major trophies and the thing as well is that I find the generations nowadays maybe sort of disregard the Glasgow Cups and the Glasgow Charity Cups but um, and back then particularly the Charity Cup was quite a big deal for Celtic in those early days. Yeah, 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 yeah very much so yes. And then yeah. so beyond that um, you know going on to be a manager at Dundee um, even his story before Celtic with you know, playing in Stenhouse Moor, not getting signed initially and coming back, and then the personal tragedy with everything that had happened, it just it sounds like a great a great man and a great footballer together it had a, a major sort of role in the club's history. I'd put him up as he being one of the one of the greatest ever selves. Um and in that sense, people need to need to know about these players so that they never get forgotten in the same way that we keep the memory of the Lisbon Lions and mm -hmm. um, those stories are live. Obviously, this is going back to sadly, obviously, all the players have, have gone now. Um, but it's important that they sort of be remembered because they set the foundations for things that were to follow and made Celtic such a, a great club from, from the mm -hmm. beginning to then. Obviously, we went through a bit of a, a bad time afterwards in the 40s and 50s, but um, yeah, yeah. before it picked up again to. Um, in that sense, I say everything about McNair's life on and off the pitch, and just his nickname alone being the icicle yeah. and part of the Holy yeah. Trinity. Can so, you excuse me again? There's somebody at my door. Go, go yeah. say it. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, so as they say, he's obviously one of the greatest selves. Everything he's achieved in terms of trophies and appearances, being a captain, and having a nickname like the icicle. It's got such a, an interesting story as well as an important one. Uh, I just wondered, could you tell us perhaps a, a favourite story or a, a favourite match at all that features McNair that's in the book? Uh, difficult to, difficult to give a favourite match because um, he wasn't that kind of a player necessarily uh, in the sense that uh, Patsy Gallagher would uh, change the course of a game, you know, as he did in the 1925 Scottish Cup final, whereas McNair was more the solid, reliable sort of chap that was there 
all the time, doing a good job as a defender, often in a very unspectacular sort of a way. But I think that um, what I would really like to single him out for was the Scottish Cup final of 1923, in which he was 41 years of age, the 31st of March 1923, um, and he was 41 years of age, and uh, he was um, uh, playing, you know, again, against players who were, in some cases, 20 years younger uh, than he was, and he just sort of strolled through the game with everything under total control. Celtic won 1-0. I don't think it was a particularly great game, but I think McNair um, defended well. In particular, I come across a report about how he was able in the latter stages of the game to take the dog for a walk, which I think means taking the ball up to the corner flag and holding it, you know, and inviting the tackle. I think that was what the, in the 1920s, taking the dog for a walk meant. And I think that would probably be, in some ways, uh, his uh, greatest uh, uh, ever game. Uh, but there are so many to choose from the uh, the Cup Finals of 1914, 1908, 1907. I mean, all these sort of great things he was involved in. He was never that sort of a, a spectacular player if you see what I mean, he would never um, he would never sort of stand out and say, well, I mean, everybody would leave the ground saying, oh, McNair had a great game the day, but they wouldn't they go and say, oh, we're going to see McNair's great defending the day, you know, in the way you would go to see Patsy Gallagher or Jimmy Johnson or somebody like that. Yeah, I think that's always uh, the mark of a good player that um, you maybe notice them more when they're missing from the team. So, yes. I, I know people in a more modern time used to say that about Paul Lambert, used to say that yes. you'd notice him yeah, more yeah, when yeah. he was out the side. Yes, uh, yes, indeed. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's quite amazing as well to think that he was playing for Celtic and winning major trophies in his 40s as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, and you mentioned as well about the taking the dog for a walk and that kind of comment. It's, um, so it again, looks at, this book will look at the kind of culture of Scottish society and um, some of the old language used and that type of thing. Yes. So, so it's an important, it'd be an important read for not just Celtic history, but kind of wider Scottish football and um, looking at the culture of, say, the culture of the reporting and um, society at that time. And then obviously, say, the cultural ties with. Celtic's kind of in inclusivity and, and that type of thing mm -hmm. as well with yes, McNair yes, playing yes, for the club. Yes, 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 yes. Um, so sort of, you say we've covered a lot about McNair. I don't want to give too much away. You have to, people will have to read the book to hear about some of the other cup finals and some of the other mm -hmm. stories. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, I'd urge everybody to do so. So where can people buy the book? I think the best place to buy it would be from the Celtic Star website. Uh, it will be available on uh, Amazon once it arrives in large numbers. Uh, a few have arrived. There are more to come yet. Um, the, and uh, the, once they arrive, they'll be on Amazon. But in particular, the Celtic Star website, www Celtic Star. that's where you can get it from. Yeah, okay. I'll, I'll put a link in the description to that um, with this episode once it goes out as well. I'll put a link to the Celtic Star website. Um, I say you can see on there the picture of the cover. It's a nice hardback book. See so the, the cover looks brilliant. And you've got some um, a collage of pictures of McNair on the inside covers as well. I've seen. Mm -hmm. um, so that you say particularly from this this sort of early era, there wasn't a lot of uh, pictures that featured in newspaper reports and things. So it's nice to have a a collection of players on somebody like this mm -hmm. that people might not have seen before. Um, so just to just to finish things off, say I'll ask you're the you're the first guest, so I can't say I've done this to every guest so far, but I I will do. Um so firstly, could you tell us what was the first Celtic game that you ever went to? Um the 29th of March 1958, Dan Spark Dundee. Dundee five Celtic three. Heavy rain. 
heavy rain. I mean, my father, I don't know what, what going to take me there because I was only nine year old. But when you're nine year old and the rain's on, that doesn't really bother you. And you prepare to cry and throw tantrums and I want to go and you promised you would take me and things like that. And so we did go. But that was the first time I saw them in the flesh, uh, 29th of March, 1958, uh, Celtic, uh, Dundee 5, Celtic 3. Um, I think Dundee, the game was more important to Dundee than it was for Celtic because Dundee weren't all that far away from relegation that particular year. It was the year of the 7-1. Uh, the 7 1 was, of course, in 1957, uh, and this was 1958. And uh, some of the 7 1 team had already, uh, you know, began to show their age. And it was far from the, the people like McVitie were playing, and uh, it was not the, um, not the 7 1 team at all. But it was the same season. That's it. You had a completely different start to life supporting Celtic, missing out on the 7 1 and then going through a difficult time there. <laughs> Um, I did cry a lot because my mother wouldn't let me go to the 7-1 game. I do remember saying I wanted to go to that, I wanted to go to that, but I think my mother and father were right in not allowing me to go because, uh, well, my, my father would have had to take me. I think he would have been quite, but I think he was working that day or something like that, but it was just, uh, I was just too young um, to go to the 7-1 game. I would have been uh, nine-year-old, so. I've heard of a, a similar story of somebody that would have been nine years old at that time, and they went, they went with um, one of their Rangers supporting uncles and said the bottles started raining down on some of their own fans and the kids at the front. It's, it went to, you know, two, three, four, <laughs> and so on. Uh, so probably a, a good choice. But see, but you obviously it was difficult times until Jock Steen arrived, but. Um, say I was the complete opposite. I started going to watch Celtic under under Martin O'Neill. So, mm -hmm. uh, say my first game was at Anfield in two thousand and three. So a bit. All right. Yes, that was a good one for your first one. That was a good one for that. Yeah. 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 yeah I was only six at that. Uh -huh, um, uh -huh. So just uh, last question for you then is: uh, What's your favourite Celtic memory? My favourite personal Celtic memory. Uh, quite a lot to choose from, quite a few to choose from, but I really think it has to be not Lisbon, not Lisbon, although I remember that one well, but the Celtic versus Dunfermline Scottish Cup final of 1965, just simply because it meant so much to us all. Uh, really, you can't imagine what life we... Well, you can't imagine, because we've had a year of, of horror... Imagine you've had several, several years of horror. Imagine you've had 11 years since you last won the Scottish Cup, eight years since you last won anything, which was in the league, the 7-1. Imagine what that would be like to the fans and what a relief it was when, uh, when we scored that winning goal, when Bill McNeil scored that winning goal. I don't actually have clear memory of a... Um, uh, scoring that goal I do remember the excitement afterwards everybody piling top of one another and everything like that I do remember very clearly the first two goals uh, but uh, I was away at the very top of the opposite terracing from the one in which McNeil scored I think it was uh, stanchion number 25 or 24 and I remember I was holding on to that for the last nine minutes huge crown round about me and I was unashamedly praying and weeping and promising to go to church every Sunday from now on, you know, <laughs> washing for the toilet and things like that. But for goodness sake, Mr. Phillips, blow your final whistle, you know. And of course he did, and it was, uh, it was great. I mean, that has to be my best ever memory, I think, you know. And uh, I not necessarily the best team I've seen, incidentally. The best... The best game I've seen was the League Cup final of 1969 when they beat the uh, Hibs 6-2. They were absolutely tremendous that day. You know, in 1969, uh, that was the... But uh, my best memory must be the Celtic Dunfermline one of 1965. Although there is, there are, there's loads of competition for that one. Yeah, and I mean, I know everybody points to 1965. It's obviously the start of the new era that led ultimately yeah, yeah, yeah. on to Lisbon. But um, obviously yeah. that's with the... The benefit of hindsight so it's good to hear the actual just purely outright for that moment the joy of yeah. getting a trophy yeah. after so long 
It always, oh, I, oh, I always amazes me when I see the footage of just how many like Dunfermline fans were there as well. And, yes, and yes. Uh-huh. Um, uh-huh, uh-huh. I've had um, a friend of mine that's a Celtic supporter in Belfast was saying that after they, you know, they lost Belfast Celtic over there, that um, obviously Glasgow Celtic was then their their sole kind of love in in life and. Mm-hmm, said it was mm-hmm. just before obviously things sort of kicked off in Ireland and said that just for Celtic to win a trophy, although they weren't at the game, it was just hearing it, you know, the news come through that Celtic had won mm-hmm. the cup and gave everybody such a, a big boost over there as well. So, um, mm-hmm. so yeah, I'd, uh, looking back, that would be one of the games that I wish, you know, if I had a time machine, if I could go mm-hmm. back, <laughs> that would be one of the games, that one in the Centenary Cup final really stand out to me. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. That was uh, that would be high up as well. Funnily enough, um, I uh, the Van Hoydonk Scottish Cup final as well, which I only watched on television. I was I wasn't there, but that meant an awful lot. With that nineteen ninety five when we beat Airdrie one nil for the same reason as uh, the nineteen sixty five Scottish Cup final, because it'd been so long since we'd won anything, and it really meant an awful lot. And that that Airdrie Cup final in nineteen ninety five was an awful game. Between two awful teams, I thought that was a terrible <laughs> idea. Airdrie were absolutely dire, but we won one no, and I have very, very happy memories of that one. <laughs> so all, the, all these times that you mentioned winning a first trophy for a long time, and it's always joyous scenes. And obviously, we've seen another team win a first trophy, their first ever major trophy, and uh, been a bit, a bit of a different reaction. So, so. Next season, Celtic get straight back to winning, um, not just for our own sake, but to do a public service to the people of Glasgow as well and stop that. Next year, <laughs> next year there would better be no uh, sacking, no devastation of George Square like there was on Saturday night. And I, as I say, I hold Celtic largely responsible for that because we keep them quiet. As we, um, we briefly sort of mentioned before I... Before I kind of came, uh, sort of started the recording. Um, obviously, Eddie Howe might be coming up. I'd, I'd seen, yeah. yes, I saw online yesterday the Daily Record expected him to be announced today, but uh, for about the 30th time, nothing's yes, come through yet. I, um, I wake up every morning, go on my laptop, and <laughs> BBC Scottish Football News. No, no say home yet. <laughs> See, I'd, I'd had hopes that, you know, something would have been announced and we could have got your thoughts on it. And, um, mm-hmm. Do you, do you uh, I suppose, without the news of a manager and things, it might be difficult to say, but are you, are you confident of Celtic coming back next season to win well, this? To be honest, I'm sometimes at the stage where I wouldn't be at all unhappy if I saw somebody like Roy Keane becoming a uh, manager. Now, I know Roy Keane has, you know, there'd be issues with Roy Keane, but it would be a way of fighting fire with fire because Keane knows how to win and he is definitely totally committed. And although he hasn't been in Glasgow very often, well, he did play for us for a short time, he definitely understands what Celtic's all about. So I would not be unhappy if Roy Keane got the job. I wouldn't have gone, gone as far as Jose Mourinho. Some people wanted Jose Mourinho to get the job, but fortunately he's away at Roma. He's just, he would be just a wee bit beyond the pale, you know, but um, I wouldn't be upset about Roy Keane. But if it has to be Eddie Howe, I shall welcome him, I shall support him, and I hope that the fans would back him up because we really need this. 2021 must never be allowed to happen again. Never, ever. Yeah. <laughs> Say so I'm I'm vastly looking forward to being able to come up and start watching games again, actually in, in the flesh rather than uh, yeah, through a course, stream or a or a yeah, yeah. TV screen. So, but um, so beyond that, I I live in hope that uh, that we'll come back. I don't have too much of an idea yet because I don't know obviously who's going to be managing the club and who's going to be coming and going. Um, mm-hmm. but let's hope it's uh, whatever's needed is is done. And we've... yes, I'm sure that the alienation of the fans can be very quickly turned round. It can be turned round with a good manager, a couple of big signings, good signings, and a few good results in the first two three games of the season. 
and uh, a certain amount of commitment for the club. I'm sure that can be all turned around very quickly and very easily. I thought that with, I know it's a different circumstance because Ronnie Dyler had won the league, but I see that attendances had obviously started to slowly fall away and we had the mm-hmm. disappointment in the in the Scottish Cup losing on penalties. Yep, yeah, um, definitely shooting. Yeah, so. But then, say, a lot of his players were, um, you know, still there when Brendan Rodgers came in and yeah, then yeah, transformed. Yeah, yeah. Say the likes of Armstrong and McGregor went to a different level. But I think yeah, even yeah. even Scott Brown, although he was established, sort of uh, improved a lot as well. And I mean, we got off to that terrible start in Gibraltar, but after that, everything sort of very quickly yeah, changed, yeah, yeah. and we went we went to that feeling of invincible and. Um, wondering how many we were going to score, no matter who the domestic opposition was. That's uh, right, yes, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, but I'll, um... Same when, same when uh, Martin O'Neill came in 2000. Uh, I mean, he was off to a great start as well, you know, and uh, very soon things were turned around. You know, all the, you know, the Dukas and all these guys that had uh, uh, disgraced the hoops in the past had gone. Ayo Berkovic and people like that just went very quickly. And uh, O'Neill brought in his uh, his uh, players and, of course, he brought out the best. And the man, I think, is the best football player I've seen playing for Celtic. Not the best, not as the best team, best football player, which, of course, was Henrik Larsson. And his ability to score goals. Yeah. That's so, why I, yeah. So, we'd, so you would say he was... Oh. Sorry, it keeps cutting uh, yeah. out. <laughs> yeah. So I was going to say, so, so do you think Henrik Larsson was better than, than the likes of the Lisbon Lions and that, that you'd that you'd seen play? No, no, I wouldn't have said, I, I don't think that was the best team, but I think uh, Larsson was the best individual player. He was probably better than, uh, well, I always liked Bobby Murdoch. Bobby Murdoch was a great player, but he certainly Larson was better than Jimmy Johnson because he had, Larson had fewer bad games. Jimmy was a brilliant player to watch, but there was occasionalness when he just didn't uh, didn't happen for him at all. Whereas Larson, you could rely on very seldom did you uh, leave the ground saying Larson didn't have a good game of the day. He let us down badly today. I can't, can't remember anybody ever saying that about Henrik Larson. And he scored some lovely goals. You know, you always felt when he was playing, you could win a game. Yeah, I I, I always liked, um, you know, you talk about different different world class strikers at that time among our school friends at in the playground and that type of thing. And I used to say about Larson, and you know, it'd be well, it's only the Scottish League. Even at that age, my friends would say that down here. But say so he could do everything. The big thing was he was a lot better in the air than a lot of strikers of. Uh-huh. that kind of bracket have you, have you had that attitude uh, given to you by your school fa- fans I bet you enjoyed the, when you met them the day after that Liverpool game yeah well I I couldn't tell them uh, that I'd gone you see because we had a, oh. had a, an unannounced day off school for that one um, oh I see right uh, uh, so I'd, I had to I was told you know if you go it was a one off it was a, a point of argument between my mum and dad actually because Dad, was, yeah, yeah, yeah. dad had got tickets through my uncle that lived up there and he said, oh, it's, you know, it's a European quarter final. I know he's only six and he might not appreciate how big this is, yeah, yeah. but, you know, I've got to take him. Um, and so in the end, my mum had started writing a letter to the teacher and dad said to me that don't give him that, just we'll say you're ill and uh, don't tell anybody about it. So, <laughs> <laughs> But I'd, actually, one of my best friends at that time was a, was a Blackburn fan. And, um, you know, we used to say about Chris Sutton that had played for them and obviously come up with us. And then um, we beat them home and away. And particularly after the home leg, it wasn't so much my friend, but it was his dad. I remember his dad and my dad, um, when I'd gone around there after school one day, they were arguing a bit about, um, you know, how they were going to they were gonna thrash us in the second leg and make amends for how lucky we'd got in the first leg. And, Obviously, it's, uh-huh. it didn't quite pan out that way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, that was good. Yes, yes. Yep. So I'll, uh, I'll wrap things wrap things up there, but thanks a lot for coming uh, on the okay. show today. Yep. Um, so a lot of good information for people about Alec McNair. And so I'd urge everybody to get yourselves a copy. You can, um, so as we mentioned earlier, you can go on to celticstarbooks.com and I'll 
put a link in the description to the podcast as well for people to go and get yourselves a copy of that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Liam. Thank you. Enjoyed talking to you. And you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.